Okay, again, um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Livingston Smith, and I am the convener and a member of the Committee for the Promotion of Research and Cayman Scholarship. Um, I'm also a professor in the social sciences at the University College of the Cayman Islands. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone to this event hosted by the CPRCS. Um, I want to welcome students and um, young persons who have come on, all the ones, everybody. I see um, President Emeritus Rod Button, um premier author as part of the audience and so and uh, many other persons. So welcome. I'm going to quickly reflect on what the CPRCS seeks to do. Um, this committee, through conferences, lectures, symposia, and other similar events, aims to introduce new ideas, deepen critical thinking on the issues of the day, and add to the growing body of academic literature on the on Cayman. It aspires to contribute to academic research and the mentorship of potential Caymanian writers. In so doing, the committee hopes to contribute to the development and evolution of these Cayman Islands. The founding members. Myself, Ms. Theresa Picari, Dr. Stephanie Cooper, Dr. Ms. Latoy Francis, Dr. Michaela Scott, Dr. Katrina Swearing, Mr. Mario Ebanks. Um, you, some of you might remember that we had a symposium in June of 2021 in which we honored the scholarship of Mr. Borden. Out of that symposium came a textbook, which I'm holding up right now. And um, this textbook has a paper also by Dr. Mikado. Now we still have copies of this textbook. You can buy a copy at Hobson Books, but you can also get one from me. All right. So we still have copies and um, it's a near 500 work, page of work. So you might want to get a copy of it, it's excellent. Um, tool entitled The Cayman Islands History, Politics, and Society, Essays in Honor of J.A. Roy Bott. I want to speak very, very briefly also about other activities of the CPRCS that you should look forward to. We are just about geared up to have our second symposium. And this time we are thinking that we're going to focus on the issues arising from the 2021 population and housing report. Then several issues um, came from that report to do with population growth, its implications, the need for a development plan for the Cayman Islands, work for, workforce policy, environmental sustainability, and many others. So I'm just alerting you to look for look forward to our call for papers, which will come out very soon. I want to encourage you to um, think about an area you want to research on and to write your views on. And to bear in mind that we want to get a, 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 an important text out of this other symposium also. Um, without further ado, we're going to have the introduction of the lecturer, and that will be done by a member of the CPRCS, Ms. Latoya Francis. And please allow me to say a few words about who she is. Um, of course, born in the Cayman Islands, the Caymanian. And um, from childhood, Ms. Francis has endeavored to leave this world better than she found it. She holds a master's degree in public administration with a focus on public and social policy from the London School of Economics. 
and she also has a bachelor's degree in accounting youth leadership development and a minor in nonprofit leadership. Um, would not be surprised if um, Ms. Francis goes on to do her doctoral studies also. Um, she has ex extensive experience in youth development and she has held various leadership roles in this capacity. Um, so I now turn over to Ms. Francis for an introduction of Dr. Michaela Scott. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. I have the pleasure this evening of introducing Dr. McKenna Scott. Dr. McKenna Scott is an educator and cultural researcher. She recently successfully defended her doctoral dissertation at Temple University. Her disciplinary training is in Africana studies with subfields in Caribbean history and political thought. Her current work examines modern manifestations of colonialism, both economic and cultural, and their impact on understandings of agency and freedom, specifically in the Cayman Islands. She received her BA in liberal arts from Louisiana State University and an MA in African American studies from Temple University. Her scholarly writings have appeared in the Journal of Black Studies, and she engages in public humanities work through appearances on podcast episodes on untold histories of the, of the Atlantic world, as well as she's a co-host on a new local political podcast titled The Backbenchers. Makana was born and raised on Grand Cayman, a proud Bodden towner, and is a graduate of the John Gray High School. She received her associate degree from the University College of the Cayman Islands, and locally she has taught courses including the Caymanian history and government, as well as a course on Caribbean politics. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Makana Scott. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Latoya. I am so happy to be here. Um, so pleased that I'm able to uh, discuss my work. And so I just want to set my timer because <laughs> um, uh, I understand we're all busy people and I really appreciate um, everyone uh, allowing me this time. Uh, so, I want to first uh, take the time out to thank you all for being here as I present the findings from my PhD research. The title of my dissertation, as you all have <laughs> been, been able to see, uh, was an Africological reimagination of notions of freedom and unfreedom in a colonial context, deconstructing the Cayman Islands as paradise. Okay. So the next two slides are just an outline of how the presentation is structured. Uh, segments will range from the significance of the study to the methodology I used. And then we have on the next slide, uh, I'll get into the results, uh, the implications, and then the conclusion. And I'm going to try to work as uh, fast as, as I can. So a quick snapshot of, of Cayman, the Cayman Islands, as many of us are aware, uh, the most recent population is counted at almost 80,000 persons. However, uh, I want to be cognizant since that time, there has been an increase uh, in that amount of the population. Um, and as you can see, almost half of our population are work permit holders. A point of interest is that the national census does not include race, and the question of race uh, was taken off the census in the 1960s. So these demographic figures are estimations. So in thinking about Cayman uh, being located in the Caribbean and the great distance to the UK, uh, this research really focused on how Caymanians understand the relationship to the previous mentioned areas, as well as analyzing how persons either believed or believed colonialism could be in their best interest. So for many years, Caymanians have really bought into the idea of economic prosperity, right? Yet what happens when we now find ourselves in a situation where Caymanians are being priced out of their own country? 
And so this dissertation really frames the Cayman Islands as an account of the limits of civility and financialization and exemplifies how erasure of African origins stagnate self-determination. So what exactly is this research all about, right? Uh, so this is a quote from Chris Christopher Williams's text uh, entitled Defining the Caymanian Identity. And I think it really encapsulates the direction this research took. And I quote, Jamaica might have been relatively stable by its independence, but some Caymanians in the present are breathing a sigh of relief that Cayman did not ultimately sever ties with Great Britain. So talk show radio, very popular here in Cayman. Um, and I just remember growing up that the subject of political independence uh, was always talked about in a negative connotation. Um, you know, quote, well, look what happened to Jamaica was something that I would continuously hear growing up. And this is also still a conversation that happens today. Um, and it really has a, a really anti-Jamaican, anti-Black tone. Uh, so it's really this enduring collective belief that I wanted to interrogate further. How and why uh, did African descended Caymanians appear to be rejecting political independence? So why did I do this research? So this uh, research, this dissertation really interrogated the current colonial situation from the perspectives of persons living within the structure who experienced it as normal and mundane. This study really looks to understand the rationale of the territory nationally, but also personally in regard to the concept that has been described as voluntary colonialism. So colonialism as a voluntary exercise and as a deliberate decision in its implementation is a concept that Caymanian scholar Roy Bodden and Caribbean academic Rex Nettleford uh, further developed. It is described as, quote, the Caymanian political decision at the breakup of the West Indies Federation to go its own way when Jamaica opted for independence. This choice to remain aligned with the colonial administration was one that is documented as within the remit of the white merchant economic class. It could be stated that the Caymanian identification with the colonial class really informed the decision to continue that relationship. Also, among many Caymanians today, there exists what can be described as, quote, an implicit dependence discourse in regard to the political decision of continuing the colonial dependent relationship that was reached in 1962. And so I define this concept as the widespread acceptance and agreement of the colonial narrative that the relative success of Cayman is a direct result of being a British colony, resulting in a largely politically or political independence averse public discourse. So while this talk really focuses more on the results in the analysis sections, I just wanted to provide an outline of the chapters of the dissertation. And I apologize, I know the font might be a little, a little small. Um, this ranges from uh, chapters such as the literature review uh, to other chapters that detail the historical framing of Cayman, um, as well as comparatively researching other Caribbean islands. And so here you can also see a continuation of the remaining chapters in my dissertation. So within the literature that I reviewed, within research on colonialism, many scholars tend to situate the colonial period as beginning after emancipation and ending in the political independence era in the 1960s in the Caribbean. The region is now commonly called the quote, post-colonial Caribbean, but there currently isn't much scholarship detailing how life is like within current overseas territories. And so I also was utilizing previous research that focused on financial services, tourism, and the political structure of these overseas territories currently. Uh, there really isn't much scholarship that focuses on Cayman and colonialism per se, but also, you know, Cayman generally. So I did use comparative research on Bermuda as well as Barbuda, which have similar histories and demographics to Cayman to really contextualize the islands. So then we have the research questions that really guided my study. Um, the first, what do Caymanians think about self-determination? 
uh, what is the impact to various Caymanian possibilities due to British colonialism. A sub question of that is if Caymanians choose to accept uh, the label of paradise for Cayman. And the last question really queried how the prevalence of being independence averse, this conversation among Caymanians is informed by concepts of agency, anti-Black racism and liberation. And so I wanted to just talk briefly about some of the prominent terms. Uh, so self-determination as a concept really borrows from Amilcar Cabral and his struggles against imperialism. His interpretations of liberation are the right of people to own their own history, as well as reclaim the right uh, of a people's development and productive forces devoid of foreign imposition. The UN also defines self-determination as a people's right to determine their development politically, economically, socially, and culturally, as you can see on the screen. Additionally, an Afropolitical definition of freedom can be understood as the ability to conceptualize the world in ways continuous with one's history. And so it's through this understanding that this term is really disengaged from the normal way that we uh, think about it in a socio-political or economic uh, understanding with changes, um, but really centers self-definition and its relation to the ability to implement it. So briefly touching on how I conducted the research, I used a methodology that really grounds African descended people in their own historical analysis. And so this approach really centers Caymanians of African descent within this research, as well as elevates their voices and understandings in the Caymanian historical and academic record. And so this research as well, specifically the questionnaire, interview construction and coding aspect of it was informed by the methodologies of constructivist grounded theory and phenomenology. So really using an Afrocentric methodology that seeks to center Caymanians in their realities, these theories enabled myself and the participants to really co-construct their experience and to interpret the meaning of their viewpoints. So the main methods utilized were a questionnaire and interview. Uh, the surveys were promoted on social media and local media, and the interview respondents were contacted using snowball and purposive sampling. As is shown, the research was done using a combination of interviews, questionnaire, content analysis, and archival research. So additionally, throughout the process, and I just want to um, switch here, uh, the responses were collected through various ways, interviews were transcribed uh, and coded via software analysis, uh, the questionnaire was accessed via the online program, and the open-ended questions uh, were coded as well. And so the total number of responses that I obtained for the questionnaire was 410. However, using the inclusion criteria, the survey sample size was 270 participants. And so this research, as you can see, um, also had a total of 23 interview participants. And this was a multi-year uh, process uh, with analysis concluding in August of 2022. So what we're all here for tonight, right? What did the research find? Um, and so I want to take the time now to go through the nine themes that emerged from the results. The first being Caymanian's views of self-determination. And so as you can see at the bottom, the majority of both survey and interview respondents did not believe Caymanians are self-determinant. So we can see uh, that there was a difference in terms of how persons interpreted uh, self-determination. And for some persons, uh, they parsed through and stated that Caymanian people were more self-determinant in their opinion than the Caymanian government. Um, also, differences were discussed in terms of Caymanians being more self-governing in the past versus the present. Um, and uh, we also saw that participants uh, survey participants did not believe political independence should be a future goal for Kima. So within the survey, 
Uh, as we can see, uh, should political independence be a future goal? Uh, almost 60% of respondents stated no. Uh, do you think of Caymanians as a self-determining people? Uh, however, we see that almost 55% of persons indicated yes. However, when the question was asked, do you think the government of the Cayman Islands is self-determining? We see the inverse of that with around 61% of persons indicating um, no. And so the rationale behind uh, many of these answers uh, were that, you know, there was a lack of education in the population or the population really had internal self-doubt in their abilities. And so we see uh, that there were discussions about Caymanians really having an affinity to England. And then that was further broken down with it being, you know, um, Caymanians really uh, having the strong voice of the oppressor locally um, or Caymanians um, feeling that they're being dictated to. Uh, however, right, we did see that there were a percentage of persons that believed Caymanians were self-determining. Uh, we see that the rationale is that Caymanians can be in control, right? Um, Caymanians are more than capable. Um, they have the capability for formal internal constitutional control. This is what we have now. Um, and additionally, I do want to note that some responses uh, did state both, you know, yes and no uh, in certain instances in regard to, to this question. And we can talk a little bit more about that um, in the Q&A. So I did want to highlight some quotes that I thought were relevant. Uh, so we see the first respondent, respondent number 13, determining what? I mean, they don't even read their history. They don't teach it in their schools. They have their commissioned people and they have committees to tell the man what to write. And then after they do that, they still don't use it in their universities or in their schools. And so I just wanted to highlight that, but as you can see, uh, there are much more, <laughs> many more quotes uh, that I wasn't able to include in this presentation, um, but I did just want to give us a snapshot of what some interview responses were uh, when faced with these questions, you know? Um, the second respondent, yeah, yeah, I would say so, we're more than capable. I think the conditioning of the past is a bigger hindrance, but I do believe that Caymanians are resilient and are self-determining people, more than capable of handling their own affairs. I believe that the majority, because of conditioning, would cause a bit of hesitation and fear and what that would possibly mean for the future. Oops. All right, and so then we see the next theme. Uh, colonialism can be viewed through a time continuum with its traditional form largely defined as a past conception. And I'll get a little bit more into that um, on the next slide. So when talking to Caymanians or asking Caymanians about their definitions or what they thought about colonialism, many persons saw it as a past concept. Um, and in this definition of a past concept, the majority of Serbian interview respondents answered with a negative view. So we saw that the majority of descriptions were about control, domination, exploitation, additionally, how it impacts a country's economic, political, and social um, systems, their norms, et cetera. Um, additionally, interview participants also noted that the way that they viewed colonialism, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of um, country uh, domination understanding. Uh, this could also play the role within multinational corporations, private enterprise, et cetera. So as we can see, some of the, the results, uh, 93, over 90% 90 of persons answered with a negative view of colonialism. Um, as we can see, discussing control, exploitation. Um, there were persons who indicated that they didn't know. Um, and there were three persons that answered with a positive definition um, of colonialism. Within the interviews as well, uh, we can see uh, that um, in discussing the sort of past understanding of colonialism, discussing it currently, 
uh, it was labeled recolonization. Um, and so persons, when they were talking about this sort of recolonization, they also talked about the sort of current manifestations and the way that colonialism shows up now in Cayman, whether it be through immigration policy or interpersonal relationships in the workplace, um, and also the role of the governor and sections 81 and 125 in the constitution were discussed when talking about the sort of current iterations of colonialism. So respondent 14, so there's the little slights and that there's the things that they tell you. It has gone as far as to, well, you know, your accent is too Caymanian. How can you be too Caymanian or sound too Caymanian in the Cayman Islands? Because in England, an Englishman sounds English. Now I understand grammar, punctuation, you know, the way that you speak, the tone, the speed is important, but in Cayman, it's not beyond the realm of possibility for employers to have a word with you and tell you that you sound too Caymanian. But instead of there being outrage and an open sort of resistance to that overt form of bigotry, because that's the only way you can describe it, we slink off, quote, can you imagine he said that to me? And it dies. Additionally, uh, the way in which persons uh, or responses uh, indicated uh, current colonialism in Cayman is also shown through a conception, um, through a psychological understanding, through thought, through mentality. So we see that um, the majority of interview participants when talking about colonialism really had uh, a sort of understanding of it being a cognitive process. Um, these were coded as colonial mentality. And so some examples that interview participants gave were such as, you know, British expats were automatically assumed to be, quote, better or smarter or more capable. Um, additionally, persons discussed, you know, Caymanians, uh, continually trying to emulate the oppressor due to having a quote, whitewash mentality. And so whether, you know, um, they were talking about it, it, it was pervasive. That was the, the current theme, right? Within the education system um, with, you know, Caymanians more than likely identifying as, as British uh, with blackness being seen as a disadvantage. Uh, a real struggle to accept history of local enslavement or slavery in Cayman and a pigmentocracy structure within Caymanian society. And so we see respondent number 20 in the middle. I can even remember when we studied history, it was always British history. So from a young age, think about it. You're always seeing these marks that are telling you that this is not only your history, but these are the people you should aspire to be like. And obviously, as a young person, you start to associate the culture and the nationalities. And then you may not even realize it that when you're older and in the workforce, you can make a decision that you tend to lean on the person with nice shiny shoes from the UK with a beautiful accent versus the local person who may know better and may actually be able to help you achieve your goals. Um, additionally, right? the last uh, quote, because a lot of the things that people are talking about now, I used to write letters and stuff like that about it in the newspaper. And it did me no great favor with people that I worked with because there were some fundamental truths in what I was saying. I discovered Caymanians had no interest in defining themselves outside of a colonial mindset. Respondent 12. And if you want to advance in upward motion, then you have to submit to colonial powers. You have to submit to a non Caymanian culture. For example, Caymanians tend to be more laid back and some say passive in their interactions. Caymanians believe that, you know, with kindness, you can open the door to almost anything in progress. Whereas if you actually want to succeed in financial services, you do have to be aggressive much like the persons that are colonizing you or colonizing Cayman, you have to adapt to their ways in order to get success in financial services. So I wanted to move on to theme four. Um, additionally, persons really stated that the colonial relationship between Cayman, Caymanians in the UK is not generally understood. Um, and so the majority of persons stated that, you know, they maybe occasionally think about this term, this concept. Um, interview respondents expressed belief that um, it may be that Caymanians don't necessarily understand the relationship 
or if they do, they take it for granted. Um, additionally, some participants stated that Caymanians maybe had a limited view of the concept. Uh, so a survey question asked, you know, how often do you think about this? And, you know, almost half said that maybe they occasionally think about it. Um, and then we can see towards the bottom of the, the screen, uh, you know, the majority of persons never rarely um, versus frequently or very frequently. And so within the interviews, uh, it provided a little bit more context. So we see that 65% uh, of respondents really believe that maybe Caymanians didn't understand it. You know, that maybe Caymanians in the way that they view colonialism is very personal. Um, they understand it through the faces of those in power in society. And so they tend to associate that with people or the white leadership class in Cayman. Um, and so then we saw that persons talked about, you know, maybe knowing that Cayman was a British overseas territory as a child, but that was different when they became an adult. Um, also talked about, you know, Caymanians um, being described as being docile and conditioned. Um, additionally, the role of civil servants were talked about as well, too, uh, just in terms of the, I guess, job understandings for Caymanians in those roles. Respondent number six. Um, okay, well, you know, we have this sort of, I would say this aroma, but there's displeasure amongst the community, amongst the community, and this uproar that's caused, and they perhaps don't fully understand why, or they sort of take the relationship for granted and not realize, not realizing how deep, you know, the constitution, legislation, policies, how deep they actually run. And then, you know, you have this disconnect with people here on the ground, and it can be quite frustrating for them to comprehend and to be okay with, you know, but in true colonial fashion, people might make a bit of noise and fuss over it for a while. And then they sort of get distracted with the latest Kardashian drama, so to speak, and they go right back to normal. But it pops its head up every couple of years with something major. So then theme five, when persons do maybe think about <laughs> um, the relationship, uh, we see that the, the UK and Cayman, um, uh, there are different understandings of that relationship, but many persons view it rather uh, negatively. And so as we see, um, persons were critical or uh, thinking, you know, critically uh, towards that relationship. There were concerns as the UK could be seen as a financial competitor and maybe could hurt or, or seek to control Cayman's finances. Um, examples also were given of, you know, the overreach of the governor into political or societal issues. Um, however, the majority of survey participants indicated that Cayman benefits from the relationship, right? Um, the majority of that is in terms of economic or financial. Um, also, reasons given were uh, defense, security, uh, natural disaster assistance, and political stability. And so we see, right, 73% of persons uh, believe, you know, that Cayman benefits from the relationship. Uh, almost 20% of survey participants said no. Um, and as we see, 35% talked about the economic financial benefit. Um, additionally, uh, persons were concerned about, you know, um, local political guidance or governmental agreed um, and they had assurance within that relationship uh, with the UK. Uh, this is a little in contrast to the interviews uh, where the majority of responses did indicate critical or negative um, feelings toward the relationship. And so many persons pointed, you know, to the tension uh, as a financial competitor. Um, many persons as well recounted, you know, historically Cayman was viewed as forgotten and ignored. Um, additionally, you know, the UK could be seen at times as pushing their own agenda, overreaching power. Uh, some persons, you know, really queried the relationship, uh, it seemed to be outdated, um, and then stated that even, you know, personally, uh, some persons from the UK, their views on Caymanians and in Cayman uh, reflect an imbalance in the relationship. 
Um, however, you know, there were persons that did point out the positive aspects of the relationship. Uh, they talked about financial confidence, the economy, um, the, the relative ease of travel to uh, Europe, uh, as well as, you know, lower UK education rates. And so persons actually did talk a little bit about a generational divide, stating that perhaps older Caymanians had a little bit more of a pleasant affinity towards the UK. Um, and additionally, some persons, what could have been perceived as positive feelings towards the UK were veiled criticism of local government. And so we have some interviews um, politically, I don't know, I think politically, Britain is trying to undo us. I think this statism where governments take a firm, let's say hand over their you know, financial parts of their economy, I think that has returned, okay? And the UK is being in charge, right? You have to do this, you have to do that. And I think in giving us all these directives, it's like, where will this leave us? Will it leave us sort of in this uncompetitive state? I don't know, Lisi respondent 23 stated that. Respondent 16. So that's how I've been able to see it, but we are causing a lot of it. England isn't causing the anti-democracy stuff that happens here. We're causing it ourselves. Why? Because people wanna hold on to power. You look at politics, you look at politicians. For the last 20 years, we haven't really changed that block. The you know persons are still there. The other persons are still there. Um, you know, persons managed to retire, something like that. But it's the same people, the same faces. And why? At the end of the day, it's been lucrative for them. Respondent 21, the the very last quote says, you know, but on the other hand, Caymanians see benefits from it, and when they go to Britain, they can see it there. When they go on the world stage and when they bust out that passport, British, and they look at you differently. You see what I'm saying? So all of those are kind of in your hand benefits that they can speak to. There also was a discussion in terms of thinking of a colonial understanding within a sort of corporation understanding. Um, and so persons were asked if Caymanians benefit from the dark group locally. Uh, the majority of respondents stated no. Uh, there was concern in relation to group uh, and influence in politics and power in general. However, other respondents, you know, indicated that Cayman is a free market economy. Um, they like some of the developments in Grand Cayman uh, and the group uh, does contribute a positive impact uh, to Cayman's economy. Uh, so we see that a slim majority of respondents, survey respondents did not believe there was a benefit. Um, however, 48% indicated that Caymanians do benefit. Uh, there was a, as we can see, a concern in relation to uh, the influence in politics, um, persons, interview responses range from perhaps there needed to be regulations and restrictions. Um, other persons just resigned themselves to the fact that they felt it was too late to do anything now. Um, but we did see, you know, the positive responses, uh, the impact to economy was the number one response, as well as incorporating, you know, Caymanian elements in, in design. Uh, respondent 16, the unfortunate thing is that DART, the organization has come around at a time where Caymanians have had family land and property passed on from one generation to another. The unfortunate part about it is that our earning power hasn't increased. So we have assets. And because, you know, other developers have come in and they're throwing a lot of money around, we sell out. That's what has happened. And that's what has consistently happened across the country. Right. People have seen I'm not going to get rich now. My salary isn't moving. My kids are hungry. I'm a single parent. But my mama left me this property beside the beach and these people want to build a condo on it and they can pay me five hundred thousand dollars. and I'm going to sell. They don't see that should be passed on from one generation to another. We've sold out of desperation and survival because that's what it's become for us right now. It has become you ask the average Caymanian. You see picking up garbage on the road, boy, gotta do this boy, cause they ain't looking out for us. Who do you, when do you look out for you? You know, you voted for the same people that have had the same ideologies for year after year, right? DART has found that in our country, the desperation. 
but then the, the last quote at the bottom, but I don't subscribe to this theory that because DART is a big company, that means that they're absolutely bad for the country and they're not doing anything good for Caymanians. They have created a lot of scholarship funds. They have created outdoor venues. They have created outdoor spaces. And you know, they, they put money back in the economy. So I can see some of the good. And so because I can see some of the good, I can't be like some of those Caymanians who are anti-DART. Theme six, uh, tourism and financial services can be seen as functions of colonialism. And so we see uh, that persons uh, agreed with that statement, uh, that a greater number actually agreed with the financial services sentiment. And so we see examples that persons gave, such as a lack of Caymanian head of banks, you know, this being an indication of a colonial sector, um, and that colonialism really manifests uh, through the sort of mental psychological uh, compared to the servitude aspect of tourism. And then persons also talked about the normalization of racist culture uh, at financial firms locally. Um, and so we see that while there were persons that agreed, a lot of persons uh, were undecided. Uh, and so I think that that maybe perhaps indicates either a lack of like knowledge or confidence um, in understanding um, or really maybe never having had the opportunity to think of the matter. So interview respondents, uh, when they questioned, you know, if any of the resources from tourism actually improved life for Caymanians, um, persons cited environmental concerns uh, in regard to tourism, um, as well as persons who questioned really, you know, this reshaping of Cayman, this narrative of Cayman by foreign workers in industry. Um, and so they also talked about, you know, um, lack of Caymanians in top positions, uh, this normalization of racist culture. Uh, however, respondents also, you know, states that, hey, you know, the UK doesn't have a hand in Cayman's tourism product, um, and it's local politicians uh, that have sold Cayman out uh, and not the UK. So we see respondent four, and I think definitely this new generation as they're interacting with other Caribbean nations, um, you know, like, for example, USVI, which were protesting with the Black Lives Matter and Solidarity, they were talking about how tourism was like a function of colonialism, basically, and how being a colony, it's getting so expensive for just the locals. And so there was a picture of a woman holding up a sign that said, it's not paradise if locals can't afford it. And that went viral, and Caymanians were also sharing that. So with the age of social media, you know, more awareness is growing. And that is, I guess, another glimmer of hope. And so then we see a, a interview respondent talking about financial services. How is it all these attorneys and accountants we have in Cayman? We don't have more in charge of big financial houses, you know. Scholars have stated using the Bahamas as an example, you know, white crooks prefer to bank their money with other white crooks rather than with black honest men. And that's a good practical explanation because he was saying what happened in the Bahamas when Pinling took over, white people moved their money and they wouldn't keep the money in the Bahamas to be managed by black money managers. They rather went elsewhere looking for other white crooks to put their money. And so what is left then for us in terms of employment? Most Caymanians go into the civil service if they have education. Those that are unskilled or semi-skilled go into construction or when a company like that. So that one could argue convincingly, I think, that tourism and financial services as pillars of our economy have little more than face value in this jurisdiction. And so also there was such a wealth of information within the interviews. Um, that there, there also could have been things coded such as labor stratification. And so uh, within these issues of labor and employment, uh, persons that were interviewed talked a lot about how, you know, um, those at the front desk within tourism aren't necessarily Caymanians. They also aren't necessarily being trained for managerial positions. Perhaps the only time a tourist would encounter a Caymanian is when they enter customs or, you know, a taxi driver 
or you know maybe um, running into someone in the supermarket. Um, additionally, within financial services, there were discussions around Caymanians not really advancing above administration levels. Um, Caymanians seldomly seen within leadership roles, and so interview respondents really talked about you know better protections for Caymanians thinking about extraction fees for firms, just really lamenting about the millions of dollars that are being made um, with no benefit for Caymanians that they perceived. So theme seven, Cayman can be viewed as paradise. Um, so the majority of survey and interview participants really embraced this concept and they agreed with Cayman being thought of as such. Uh, they talked about you know, low crime, beauty, the environment, um, as well as these sort of cohesive cultures in Cayman. Those that you know, disagreed with that view cited the high cost of living and that Caymanians were really marginalized in their home country. And so we see within the survey questions, you know, 56% of persons stated yes. Um, most reported you know, low crime, safety um, as being the rationale for them believing so, um, as well as you know, the friendly people, the high standard of living, the strong dollar um, that, that Cayman has. Other persons cited the high cost of living, right? For those that were in disagreement with that statement, everyone um, had an issue with it being economical, right? Um, persons indicated, you know, paradise for them. Um, Caymanians are struggling to survive. Uh, Caymanians are seen as second class citizens. And so the interviews as well, a good majority agreed. Uh, they talked about, you know, Cayman being compared to other parts of the world. Uh, really talked again about low crime, the beauty and environment. Um, however, interview responses did talk about understanding that it could be relative based on economic standing, quote unquote, a rich man's paradise. Um, others really questioned that we need to evaluate what we view as paradise, you know? Um, persons reported that no, Cayman is not paradise, not for Caymanians, it's the illusion of paradise, and many persons cited economic reasons. Respondent number eight, I think of Cayman, it's home, paradise. I guess in some ways compared to other parts of the world, you know, we have a lot to be grateful. And I guess years ago, it might seem, I guess, environmentally or whatever, more paradise. Some areas now, I, I, the nostalgia just overtakes me when I drive through certain areas. I just sometimes, it just sometimes makes me very um, sad because, and I think back to in some ways, we didn't think maybe it was paradise then because of all the mosquitoes, you know? Yeah, pluses and minuses, yeah. Sometimes I just wonder, yeah, what Cayman is gonna be like in 10 or 50 years, just with the population and the makeup of the population. And then we see the, the middle uh, quote, respondent number 12. Yes, it is a paradise for Caymanians, but what we're only observing the benefits of this paradise, we can go to the beach, yes, but more and more beach access, there seems to be more and more arguments attempting to restrict beach access. So I query whether in the future we will be able to enjoy the beach when at least when I go to a restaurant on Seven Mile Beach, you know, most of the time, most of the time, I don't feel comfortable. I feel like I'm not wanted in those restaurants or establishments. So then we also have, you know, respondent number one, it's it is a paradise. It absolutely is. But it's a paradise for those for them and not for us. It's absolutely hell for us. And not, not just because, not, not just the poor Caymanian, even the average Caymanian, the working class Caymanian. Those who may have had a little bit of money at one point are so marginalized and oppressed. It's just, it's hell, sister. We, if we could figure out how to leave, a lot of us, a lot more of us would leave. If we had the monies together to leave, we would leave. A lot of us don't want to go that far. Respondent 21. And for a lot of people, they will tell you no. And I think we have an issue if that's gonna be the answer. So as great as Cayman is, housing prices are to a point where your regular Caymanian can't afford housing. You know, The cost of living is being driven up to a point where regular Caymanians can't afford and live a decent life. You know, It's sad that Feed Our Future has to be a thing where we have an organization prior to the government saying that we'll feel, feed all of our kids in school and primary school, at least you had, you, you know, you had a private organization raising money to ensure that a lot of our indigenous Cayman children were fed breakfast and lunch at school. 
because they're not getting it at home. I think that's an indictment on us as a country when we on the world stage look like the successful paradise. And so theme eight, Caymanian identity entails feeling superior due to economic circumstance. And I'll describe that a little bit more too. Uh, the majority of Caymanians, uh, or the majority of persons, yes, Caymanians described uh, themselves and Caymanians as having a negative view of, of Jamaica. Um, and so this is really in relation to economic circumstance. Um, and a majority of survey respondents indicated that they believe Caymanians just had a negative view towards not just Jamaica, but other Caribbean islands. Um, and the rationale was, you know, safety, um, financial and political instability. So we see within the surveys, um, you know, the majority of persons indicated yes, you know, some persons answered other, you know, it happened sometimes, not on a large scale, not all Caymanians, you know, hold these views. Um, and so then when they, asked, they were asked if they answered yes, you know, what do you think is the basis of this prejudice? Um, and so we see that the majority stated, you know, safety, crime, racism, um, and then financial and political instability. So we see from the interviews as well, most respondents describe the relationship, having a negative view. Um, we can see the rationale that Caymanians view themselves may be privileged. Uh, they believe this superior due to economic circumstance. Um, you know, Caymanians really wanting to maintain their UK connection, um, a fear of you know job loss, um, and then others kind of talked about the relationship being a sibling rivalry animosity. Uh, and so within the interviews, though, you know, Cayman has talked about the positive views of Jamaica, you know, the close historical family ties, how integral Jamaica was to quote building Cayman, um, you know, really stated that their positive feelings in terms of the educational opportunities, um, many persons likened it to, you know, a love hate relationship. But more persons also talked about, you know, uh, Caymanians needing more education on the relationship as well. So we see respondent 22. And of course, you know, constitutionally, we were linked for a very long time, formally, from 1863 up until 1962, right, when Jamaica, you know, gained its independence. So because of that relationship, of course, we had people coming from Jamaica, often as teachers and other professionals, doctors and so forth, particularly the early days and worked within our systems and were the people who helped develop us and so forth. I think that in a funny way though, it's a kind of love-hate relationship. Um, and so we see respondent 10 as well, just talking a little bit about, you know, parishes such as St. Elizabeth in Jamaica having strong Caymanian roots um, and talking a little bit more about that history as well too. And so the last theme, you know, Caymanians don't necessarily consider themselves to be Caribbean people. Uh, and so many persons, you know, stated that they didn't believe that and that they felt that economic circumstance really informed this belief. Um, some of the rationale was also that, you know, Caymanians perhaps felt more British than Caribbean. Um, you know, Caymanians maybe not necessarily sharing a history of slavery, um, maybe not necessarily knowing history, as well as Cayman's Western location within the Caribbean. However, in interviews, um, persons did cite the connection to the Caribbean through, you know, um, CARICOM. Um, many persons as well cited, you know, similarities that they saw uh, to Bermuda. Um, many persons additionally talked about more partnerships within the Caribbean um, that were needed. So then respondent 13 in the middle, you know, talks about their thoughts on it. Yeah, when they want to be identified with the white places, if we had white countries in the Caribbean, they wouldn't isolate themselves, but they're not going to identify with blackness and they're not going to identify with losses. They're not going to identify with the, with the negative results of colonialism in the Caribbean and slavery. And then respondent 10 at the bottom, I feel like Cayman is in a position that we could actually help to galvanize a lot of our Caribbean neighbors. And I think that the issue in the Caribbean as a whole is we're always in competition. And I think that as a region, we need to start to be more unified. We need to realize that we are all one same dog puppy. We all eat guineps, we all eat mangoes, we all live off the sea. 
we all have very similar heritage. We all wear the same quadrille skirt, you know, do the quadrille, the color is just different. That's all, you know. Uh, there were some other topics that came up, you know, just in terms of um, a lack of Caymanian culture, history, politics being taught um, for persons that attended college, you know, locally, almost half, you know, learned about Caymanian history then. Um, additionally, more than half of survey respondents really felt that their education prepared them for administration jobs or for career in government or finance. And so this is just a brief summary of the themes. And of course, I'll be going back to them in the conclusion as well, too. So just thinking about the findings, you know, are these findings supported by the general research or, you know, dominant literature on the subject? And I just want to briefly uh, share some results uh, of the, 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 the research. Uh, so one of the main factors that really impacted respondents believing uh, that Caymanians were not self-determination, were not self-determining was the lack of political education. And so this is in agreement with historical accounts of Caymanian men's, uh, their seafaring careers, really negatively impacting their political engagement just due to them being away from Cayman um, months at a time during the year. Uh, furthermore, in you know, the successive generations that followed, uh, the merchant elite class in Cayman really controlled the political arena. Um, Vauden states, quote, they have neglected to enlighten their constituents about how the Westminster form of government works. Uh, and so we see that, you know, uh, the stranglehold of political power by persons in power really inculcated their views into the wider public. Um, you know, when the discussion of constitutional advancement uh, was had prior, uh, these persons that advocated were seen as being, quote, power hungry, were seen as, you know, quote, seeking independence, um, as well as inferred as being corrupt. And so we also see within the responses from participants that this thinking might not necessarily have changed a lot throughout the years, um, as many Caymanians still view themselves as not being aware about the historical political situation. Um, additionally, you know, Caymanians were seen as going with the status quo, having internalized self-doubt about themselves. Uh, a participant really noted that while Caymanians are now more formally educated, um, you know, it was suggested that a correlation could be made between, you know, an increase in Caymanian self-doubt being related to an influx in expat workers within the financial services uh, and government industry, right? So Cayman really perceives this modernization period beginning in the 1960s after the seafaring industry ended um, and you know the, the origins of financial services and tourism really began and so the Caymanian government utilized you know expertise from the UK's um, FCO foreign and commonwealth office and from the US uh, and these persons arrived in Cayman to really help develop the industries and so this period and this influx in technical assistance and the aftershock of this paternal treatment of the local population continued to linger years after um, and yet there were you know responses towards self-determination really indicating you know past glimpses of a determinant population through the settlement er era um, you know, this recollection really discusses the periods of isolation um, when Cayman, the, the islands were relatively ignored by the outside world. You know, Caymanians really overwhelmingly accepted the descriptor of paradise. Um, and so, you know, refusal of the term was attributed to the high cost of living. Um, you know, a few responses viewed the term critically in relation to the current social realities that Caymanians are facing. Um, a participant linked the term to, you know, exoticism uh, and the history of European consumption in the region. Um, and so really unpacking this sort of representation of the region that grew from a European imaginary and this sort of wildness, this overrepresentation of nature that seeks to render Caribbean people invisible to the tourist gaze. And so, you know, similar to the labeling of Cayman kind, it really remains to be seen how Caymanians understand themselves um, outside of the language of how others view them. You know, what is to be understood if Caymanians really buy into this 
notion of primarily being a site of enjoyment for other people. You know, when a people do not collectively know their history, it really leaves room for others to tell them their own stories. And so this identity of being friendly and welcoming is one that has, you know, perennially inculcated uh, the Caymanian population. And so thinking about Caymanian identity, um, economic conditions in Cayman really tend to dominate um, the society as well as the marked materialism uh, that's rampant, you know, without a firm grasp on their cultural foundation, really what is it that Caymanians see every day, right? Construction, development, an influx of foreign labor, these are all touted as examples of a robust economy. And so really making sense of their everyday experiences, many Caymanians identity is situated around the sort of administration of financial services as well. And so we see that be it a sort of like lack of like national pride or other indications that would measure a cultural awareness, the Caymanian identity is then reduced or the Caymanian understanding is then reduced um, to differentiation based on economic success, right? And we see that this is also ingrained in successive government platforms that have advocated and primarily catered to private business to ensure the continued financial success that is often the narrative surrounding the islands. And so this identity that's contingent on economic success, as we know, right, may face challenges as many more Caymanians are finding it hard to keep up with the standard of living locally. Um, relative to other Caribbean countries, the majority of Caymanians have maintained, you know, a relatively middle-class comfortable life. However, we're seeing this rapid pace of development and population growth through expat labor. Um, there may be crisis for Caymanians ahead or Caymanians are in crisis, you know, not just in the physical material living conditions, but also the implication for what was once a foundation for Caymanian identity may really become illegible or unable to read in the near future. You know, so much of the Caymanian identity has been in relation to, right? Relation in opposition to uh, the Caribbean, political and financial struggles in the region, a history of enslavement, you know, that is really difficult to sort of determine who Caymanians are. And so uh, in conclusion, right, what does it all mean? Uh, there are four insights that were uncovered in the research. And so this really interrogated Caymanian's thoughts on self-determination, um, you know, uh, really thinking about, you know, for persons that are economic minded, you know, as long as persons are living comfortably or there's no economic discomfort, then they won't see the need to take steps for greater autonomy. You know, um, a respondent discussing constitutional changes queried the rationale behind it being a perceived, you know, superficial surface level alteration. They stated the problem wasn't that Caymanians didn't have power. It was that, quote, we actually don't know what we have. And so Roy Bodden is of the belief that having a discussion regarding self-determination without calling for political independence is possible in Cayman, right? But there would be a need for a gesture toward a more thoughtful and imaginative political structure, you know, as well as a historicized cultural understanding for such a discussion to lead to anything approaching self-determination. Um, you know, additionally, what has sort of, you know, led to this normalization of the, the current arrangement, you know, um, really thinking about uh, cultural uh, suppression uh, is a cultural suppression of a people is a feature of empire, uh, Milcar Cabral uh, quote. And so this inattention to culture, right, is prominent within Cayman, um, evidenced by the minimal sort of representation and analysis and education um, and the broader, you know, community. And so really due to this lack of uh, cultural analysis, Caymanians are really, you know, geared towards financial services or law or, you know, the tourism industry. So Caymanians view, how Caymanians view other countries' success is limited to economic standing. And so, you know, while one can perhaps view the national pride that other politically independent Caribbean countries have and see the values in it, um, you know, the consequence 
to having an absence of culture in Cayman is that there's an overrepresentation um, of the economic, right, compared to the cultural success that is visible. Um, and so this can also be seen reflected in the political directorate um, that really places importance on development and population growth um, over and to the detriment of the Caymanian population. And so financialization, you know, Cayman being economically focused is really reflected in our national heroes. Um, you know, the first national hero being lauded as a pioneer in tourism, other national heroes, including legislators, model civil servants, and really not discounting their impact. However, it's indicative, right? That those Caymanians that we view as being the most inspiring, courageous, and reflective of the best of us are those that contributed to the bottom line. And so, you know, furthermore, this over-reliance on financialization, economic development, and stimulation has really contributed to an influx of foreign workers that are needed to, to fill employment positions. And so these sort of increase um, and the sort of convergence of all these other cultures um, with this sort of malleable Caymanian identity um, really has led to uh, tensions between these segments of the community. And so, you know, um, within the decolonization period in the Caribbean in the 60s, Cayman was hesitant in aligning with the West Indies Federation for, quote, fear of losing their economic prospects and visa waiver privilege granted by the United States. And so it's really apparent that the economic is a real centralizing aspect to the Caymanian identity. And it's really the main deterrent to self-determination if the financial success of Cayman is attributed to being a British colony. And so then just thinking about, you know, um, the, the sort of uh, education system in Cayman uh, really doing a great job of training uh, workers and fulfilling the economic purpose of the larger globalized economy. Um, this has led to an unequal society development and overrepresentation of financial services. And, you know, tangentially um, related to this lack of an engaged intellectual community, there are no mass movements of politically educated Caymanians. And so we see that a well-informed political base really endangers not just the colonial structure, but the political one as well. And so within the current climate, um, an interview respondent really talked about a politician whose political strategy was, quote, you keep them dumb, keep them under your thumb, right? And so Baden has critiqued the majority of the political class that have not had any inclination toward, you know, educating the public or inspiring any sense of introspection uh, towards a self-actualized population. And so uh, he suggested an inclusion of civics and politics within high school curriculum, as well as courses at the tertiary level to really combat this lack of political education. You know, uh, the average age of a Caymanian voter is 52, uh, compared to the median age of a Caymanian, 38. Um, so we see that the voting population in Cayman heavily skews towards the older population. Um, yet we can also think about this maybe by by design. Um, as we know, the working population, you know, the majority of Caymanians are employed by the government. Civil servants are expected to be neutral towards national, you know, elections and referendums. And this really stifles a significant portion of Caymanians from engaging in activism or even contributing publicly to, to public discourse, right? And so the resultant of a weak cultivation of activism um, or protests also manifest in other areas. And so when there are instances of persons that really emerge voicing the frustrations of everyday Caymanians, they're oftentimes not supported when it matters. And so a respondent recounted um, that when persons are elevated by the community, uh, said community is ultimately absent from the mass gatherings or the public protests for fear of reprisal um, and loss of job prospects. And so the respondent stated poignantly, you know, Caymanians want a leader, um, but they don't want to follow. 
And so then uh, lastly, I just want to talk about, you know, the refusal of Caymanians to acknowledge the enslavement of African people within the islands really contributes greatly to the cultural deficit amongst the population. You know, there, there aren't any monuments or public acknowledgements um, really to enslavement, but we have, you know, Pirates Week Festival and now recently expanded to a Pirates Week Fest with events taking place over a three month period you know, there haven't been any um, evidence of pirate settling in Cayman, yet this sort of imaginary is valued more in the Caymanian public calendar than enslaved Africans that really contributed uh, to the cultivation and development of the islands. Um, and so it really stands to reason, right, like if there was no slavery in, in the islands or a minimal amount, then Caymanians are really more apt to adopt and identify with colonial administration. And so what really makes Cayman different to other Caribbean islands, such as Bermuda, that is often compared to at times, is that while whiteness is present, it's not critiqued. And so we also see these organizing principles, such as cultural unity, uh, economic class solidarity that really played a large role within the decolonization period in the Caribbean can also be seen as useful in really beginning to unravel the colonial myths that are present in the Caymanian community to date. So the implications, right? Um, you know, recently there have been discussions on social media as to why Emancipation Day was taken off the Cayman Islands public holiday schedule. Um, I think that these discussions and, you know, hopefully placing it back will be a useful place to start to encourage and to grow the historical cultural awareness that many of us are missing, right? Um, additionally, you know, local research conferences and analyzing the works that previous Caymanian scholars have done are really great ways to encourage public um, political participation and really cultivate space for Caymanians to voice their opinions and thoughts. And so future research, you know, we continue to center Caymanians and their thoughts. Um, you know, I'm really thinking a little bit more about Caymanian culture, um, the enslavement period as a historical area of study that I want to explore, um, as well as really assisting and bringing to the forefront, you know, contemporary socioeconomic issues that are affecting uh, Caymanians. And so in conclusion, you know, the, the sort of expansiveness of this research in many ways really tries to occupy the complexity of the Caymanian experience. Um, and so what I uncovered is that, you know, what is perceived as sort of mundane or boring questions in academia was really seen as provocative uh, to the Caymanian public, you know? And this research has really illustrated that Caymanians are, you know, not only worthy of study, but they're capable of forging their own futures on their own terms. And so uh, with that, I just want to, you know, say a big thank you to my family and friends for all of their support um, and everyone on this Zoom tonight, you know, and also the, the greater Cayman in public at large um, as this research literally uh, would not have been possible without you. Um, and I do want to note that this picture is a little old because not only <laughs> do I have two nephews, I have a third as well too. So I'm guessing we'll need to, to recreate this picture pretty soon. Um, but thank you all so much. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Scott. I think we, we can all say that that was a comprehensive uh, presentation that you covered such a vast ground in such a short time. And uh, you certainly have left us awed by all the, the data you have presented and, and the analysis that you have brought to it. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to have the, the Q&A very shortly. Uh, so please don't leave, please don't leave, stay with us, please. Um, uh, at the end of the event, uh, you'll see a pop-up asking you to just say how you learned about this event. And if you could kind of leave with us your, your, your other data, like your um, email and telephone number, because we want to be in touch with you as we have other plans. Um, so for those who came a bit um, before we, after we started, um, I wanted to share with you that we still have copies 
of this book that came out of her last um, symposium. It's entitled The Cayman Islands History, Politics and Society. Um, essays in honor of J.A. Rob Borden. Uh, you can get copies of this book at Books and Books and just call me if you want a copy also, uh, Livingston, 916-6462. Um, so when I mentioned the persons who started CPRC, and I should also mention uh, Mr. Billy Ebanks, the very important part of the membership of this committee that seeks to do these kinds of things. Uh, one last thing before I turn over to Ms. Teresa uh, to do the Q&A, uh, please keep in mind, look out for um, our next symposium. We are thinking about having a symposium on the issues arising from the 2021 population and housing uh, report. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, an opportunity for you to write a paper and to get published and to be a part of the conversation. All right. So I now turn over to Ms. Teresa Pitcairn. Um, she's a, a, a vital part of what we do at CPRCS. And um, as you know, she's a lawyer by profession and, and she does many other things. So Ms. Ms. Um, Teresa, I turn over to, to you at this time. Thank you so much. Oh, so thank you so very much, much Dr. Lev. Mikana, well done. Um, I just think girls rock, women rock. I mean, you know, this just, it's, it just warmed my heart as I listened to you cover some really, really sensitive trajectory, you know? And I thought to myself that um, the derogatory assumptions that we have about ourselves and our character and identity, I am not even sure now how to have a conversation about that anymore, having listened to some of your findings. What came through to me right throughout the whole um, convert, your discussion was Franz Fanon's work about this double consciousness that we carry with us coming out of that colonial um, experience. Now, and I'll only mention that very briefly because it's a form of schizophrenia where, you know, we have this inner struggle between two opposing identity of self. On the one hand, we aspire to be like a colonizer. And on the other hand, we struggle to um, accept who we are. And that kind of resonated right throughout the whole discourse. And I heard how the economy impacts that um, experience, but it's what is really interesting for me is listening to your experience coming out of your research and trying to see how this now informs us today and in the future. Uh, do you, by the way, do you want any water, McKenna, before I get on board? I, I took some, thank you. <laughs> right, so I'll just jump on to the question and um, Again, thank you so very much, all of you who joined us this afternoon and McKenna for doing a stellar job. So one of the questions was this, um, how were your respondents balanced in terms of age? Were the responses regarding a new view, a new definition of colonialism noted among the younger respondents, for example, or contrarily, were ideas about remaining under the British rule more prevalent? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that, <laughs> where do I want to start? I, I want to begin in just stating that there, there was so much data, and I think that I'm just now in the beginning stages of sifting through that. And so for me, what was most pertinent was sort of organizing the themes and just getting that information out there that I haven't necessarily at this point in time contrasted or looked at any sort of correlation between age groups or um, you know levels of education, if that plays a role as well. So I have all of the data, I just haven't um, done that analysis. And so, I mean, I think that this 
this work and the, the continuous work, um, it's so rich and there's so many points of view and um, uh, sort of you know entry level ways that I can think of it. Um, also keeping in mind that um, you know I used perhaps you know 270 out of over 400 uh, survey responses as well too. So I do want to be cognizant of that um, and just state that this is very much the beginning stages of this, um, but that is something that I'm taking into consideration um, as I continue this work. But but thank you so much for the question. Uh, thank you so very much, McKenna, for that response. People are asking whether or not the presentation that is being recorded will be made available to all, to everyone. Okay, so I'll just let you answer quickly. Uh, yes, yes. I, from from what the committee has has told me, um, this is being recorded um, as well as being streaming as well too. And so um, I'm guessing we'll use the media outlets to to inform um, as to you know where persons can view view the recording. I know it was a lot of information, um, so so definitely keeping that in mind as well too. So there was another question that I had that um, I'm hoping that you know people will try to assist us with getting our, wrapping our heads around because when we discussed your um, PhD and the thesis and some of the more intricate issues that you were hoping to address, one of the things that I know that I raised on several occasions was this whole idea of symbols, whether or not symbols are important, whether or not it matters. And I raised it in the context of Barbados who haven't, after 300 years, um, as you know, being a part of this transatlantic slave hub, they decided that they wanted to have their own, uh, someone from their own community as the head of their state, rather than Queen Elizabeth number two, soon to be King Charles. And they decided that even though this transition to becoming a republic was really something that wasn't even noticeable per se, but for them it was important. So they preferred seeing their own flags rather than the flag of an entity with an oligarchical uh, history of enslavement. And when I listened to the facile way in which persons responded to some of the questions that you raised, I was at a loss because, and me, you know, this, you know, you talked about um, Professor Nettleford and um, Honorable Roy Borden talking about voluntary colonialism. At some point, we have to really flesh that out and really, really see where we land with that because. Who in their right mind, you know, want to live a life where you're not in control of your own destiny? And this is not to suggest that, you know, this is something that's going to happen overnight. But I know Honorable Roy Borden and certainly Honorable Ezra Miller, they have always spoken about the importance of trying to understand this, you know, because it will have, you know, Rather negative ramifications for us, but you know, you spoke yeah. about our youth, yeah. how they so in as much as they're saying this economic miracle is something worthy of embracing, but on the other side, they're saying, hey, look, we're not even participating in this success. So what does that mean? And this is what I mean when I talk about this double consciousness yeah. that even yeah. our youth have now in trying to make some sense of their reality. Definitely. And Ms. Teresa, I think I think you you've raised a really good point, right? The insidiousness of colonialism. It is the the sort of mundane, everyday understanding that we see, right? It it wasn't for me. Um, until I had attended, I think it was a, a global young leaders conference at the UN um, in New York when I was a teenager. And, you know, people were going around introducing themselves and, and you know, I'm from the Cayman Islands. And then person's like, oh, you're, you know, an overseas territory. Like, don't you want freedom for yourself? And I guess I was struck in that, you know, in that time because I, 
it, every it was so normal you know like to have the queen on on our money to to sing god save the queen as the national anthem i think that these are these are things that we just the assumption is that it's just what we do, you know? And so I think that even the conversation surrounding, you know, sovereignty and self-determination, the very first step is perhaps this sort of, um, not awakening, but maybe questioning of, well, why is it, you know, that, that, that we have um, a person that's appointed by someone else and that they ultimately, you know, can veto parts of, you know, our political system or our laws that, that you know, they, they may not necessarily like. Um, I think that it really starts with the sort of questioning as to, you know, um, well, is this normal? What do we define as normal? Um, and I think that really this work really speaks to that in terms of um, within the interviews, you know, I interviewed persons that um, of various, you know, um, job descriptions and, and various life experiences that really spoke to the population and really understood, you know, perhaps the Caymanian psyche. And so I do think that the job of the intellectual, the job of, you know, these thinkers are to really start to ask the questions um, to get the people thinking. And I think that these spaces really encourage that. Um, and I'm encouraged by the support um, that that persons have. And perhaps, you know, I haven't been in the game for as long as, as many persons are, but perhaps it is, you know, the sort of like reinvigoration or, you know, the sort of energy that perhaps the young persons have and the young people are, you know, on Instagram and Facebook and they're asking these questions. And so I think that, you know, it's the, the job of, of us to maybe, you know, facilitate these questions and facilitate this energy um, as well. So I, I mean, I hope that that um, provides a little bit of a bomb, but I, I do think that, you know, when you start to ask these questions, when you start to really interrogate the situation that Caymanians find themselves in, um, that, that it can be disheartening as well too, you know? And so I do want to, um, I do want to, to acknowledge that as well. Thank you so much, Diana. There's another question. Does anyone know why race was removed from the national census? What was the rationale around that? Yeah, I um, I contacted, and so I thank thank for the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I contacted the National Archives um, because I was um, interested in that because I was I was thinking. I mean, I guess I always grew up and just thought, oh, well, you know, race is just something that, you know, just isn't on the, the census. Um, but it wasn't until I started researching that um, I believe with the way in which the, the Caribbean um, has sort of unified their census um, taking you know, abilities or organizing in the 60s that the question from Cayman was dropped, but I'm not certain as to why or how because race was included i think in the 1934 i think that might have been like the last um census that included race it was included but i'm not too certain as to when it it dropped um in the 60s but also when we think about you know emancipation day um as a public holiday was also celebrated in cayman up until 1961, I believe the archives has found have found as well too. So I do think that that's an um, an interesting area um, for further discussion as well. But as of this point, I, I don't I don't know. It's a lingering question. Mm. Thanks, Mix. Uh, there's another question. In your research, did anything come up about the role of the church in the perpetuation of colonization, colonial thinking, the subjugation of our people? and its contribution to the weak cultivation of activism or selective activism. Thank you for the question. Ms. Teresa, could you repeat the, the first question is the role of? Yeah, so hold on. The role of the church? Yeah. yeah, in your, did anything come up about the role of the church in the perpetuation of the colonization or colonial thinking, the subjugation of our people and its contribution to the weak 
cultivation of activism or selective activism? Ooh, what a question. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you to whoever um, posed that question. Uh, so I didn't, um, I didn't utilize any questions that specifically um, talked about that, but within some of the survey responses, oh, sorry, within some of the interview responses, um, there was a sort of questioning of, um, the entire sort of instrumentality of colonialism. So that included not just the political sphere, but also the social sphere as well. Um, and so participant, I believe maybe one or two um, did talk about that, but it, it didn't play such a central role um, within my research. I think that, um, I guess further work, I mean, yes, A, I, I understand the question and, and that needs further interrogation. Um, but I do think uh, in thinking about um, Cayman as a British overseas territory, um, many English speaking, you know, Caribbean countries, uh, the question of religion um, is one that that plays a, a central part in organizing social structures. Um, and so I do think that uh, when we think about religion, or even when we think about African religion, or, you know, when we think about, um, you know, the, the concept of Obia and the, the sort of discussion around it, I think that we're seeing um, more scholarship that's being done in terms of uh, the sort of way in which um, these, you know, indigenous uh, religious um, practices were persecuted and you know we still have on the books you know the penal code um and where does the penal code come from um so i think that that's a very rich discussion uh i unfortunately did not um utilize that within this research but that definitely um is an aspect when we talk about you know colonialism and the social sort of undertaking um and the real life sort of ramifications and and you know terminology and originations of you know our belief system and everything like that but that's a very rich question so i think i think whoever asked that question mm -hmm. so the uh questions or the box that contain the comments are filled with really congratulatory messages about what you have achieved and you know folks are really proud of of and and you know something too which is which for me is very heartening i there is this energy that is conveyed that people actually genuinely, genuinely want you to succeed and are genuinely proud of what you've done. And I say this now coming from my generation because, you know, in many ways in which folks spoke with forked tongues, they would say to your face, oh, that you're nice and you're sweet and you're pretty and you're all of that. And then the minute you turn around, they're saying something negative. That is something that I'm noticing that's changing in the culture, which is really, really something that is to be proud of. And in the messages that we see here, it's just littered with this love, this love energy for um, the work that you've done and the achievement. So many, many, many congratulations. Thank you. I Mr. Risa, I think I see a, a hand raised by mm -hmm. um, O'Neill Hall. OK. I so. I'm looking at all the questions in oh, the chat. Okay. So unless, okay, because there's one question that says, what steps do you think can be taken by either students or teachers to help push the deeper topics of Caymanian culture and history regarding what has been left behind, for example, with slavery on the island? That's one question coming from, this is, the person is unidentified. Yes, yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for the for the question. I mean, I, I think that um, I can't sing enough praises for the archives, um, as well as the cultural foundation, they have quite an extensive um, uh, list of, of or, or books in their library. And I think that um, the archives does such a, a great job of, of having information for us. But a lot of times, you know, we just don't necessarily know. Um, I do think that the National Museum as well, too, has um, within their their sort of libraries, um, books written 
written, you know, by Caymanians um, about Caymanian culture and history um, and politics. And so I think that uh, the first step is that maybe um, accessing the information. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of the, the archives holds a, um, uh, oral history collection where they interviewed, um, I believe it was started in the 90s, where they were realizing that a lot of older Caymanians weren't necessarily, um, uh, they, they were unfortunately transitioning, you know, and uh, their stories weren't, weren't being told. Um, so they started uh, recording, uh, you know, just conversations with older Caymanians. And I think that's a wealth of, of information as well too. Um, and I really hope that, you know, the, the committee um, that we really uh, try to utilize, you know, the, the sort of uh, brain power that, that we have and really, um, you know, cultivate this this, this conversation so that persons, you know, can look forward to conferences and persons can, you know, um, read the, the, the texts that, that Caymanian scholars um, have, have written as well too. So I think I listed um, quite a number of places um, where hopefully, um, you know, teachers and, and other um, persons in, in the cultural, you know, realm um, can access as well too, to really start to, to to teach our, our children. And I think that a lot of times too, um, maybe Caymanians aren't as proactive as we, we could be. Um, I think that a lot of times we perhaps, you know, um, wait for things to happen. That could be that we don't feel equipped um, or we don't think that we have enough information to act. Um, but I really think that if persons are interested, you know, um, in, you know, accessing more knowledge and information that, you know, the archives are there, the mu museum is there, CNCF, the Cultural Foundation is there, um, you know, Caymanian books are, are being sold in Caymanian bookstores. Um, so there, there's information is there. Thank you very much for that, Mikana. Um, uh, Dr. Liv, do you, I have been trying to search for the hands because I understand that um, there's a gentleman, uh, Mr. O'Neill Hall is trying to ask a question. I think I can I can ask him to unmute or ask that's him to that's ask yeah because I see yeah I see the hand and it says ask the unmute it's okay unmute now uh, would you okay can he ask the question then just go ahead yeah I think so yeah go yeah because mm -hmm, we can hear thank you Dr Scott for that great presentation I've been following your work uh for quite a number of years now, and to see the end of your study is a great blessing. And it is uh, clearly from my own study on Cayman, it seems as if both of our work have overlapped on several of the issues, which I'm thinking about a lot of uh, <laughs> a collaboration between both myself and you, on further study on the Cayman Islands. So I think we should exchange info and work on some form of collaboration. But my question to you uh, is really on the concept of race and ethnicity in Cayman. Uh, do you think uh, that Cayman is really double conscious or I want to introduce a new concept that it is uh, triple conscious, because it seems as if from my own study and also my own observation of the Cayman Islands is that politically the Cayman Islands, uh, or Caymanians I should say, they admire the political culture of the British, but at the same time, the culture is not so much British but the culture seems very Americanized. And while at the same time, uh, within the society, from what I have observed as an outsider, is that there is this struggle also to maintain this unique Caymanian identity. So it's not really for me a double consciousness, but a triple consciousness taking place within 
the Cayman Islands. So I would love for you to comment on that. Yes, thank you so much for your, your question. Um, uh, uh, I believe, uh, first of all, we may be met in the archives, I want to say, many years ago. Um, and I've uh, read your work on, I believe, uh, uh, Pedro St. James and the, the work that you've done on um, enslavement there. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, thank you so much for your, your question. It, it's really generative uh, in thinking about this, this uh, triple consciousness as you, you terminal, uh, your terminology that you used. Um, so I do think that uh, within Cayman, because we have um, a, a quote the the term right a, a cosmopolitan or you know there's so many different um cultures there's so many different persons uh from from various walks of life that live in cayman that i think uh some of the tension we're seeing is that because there isn't necessarily um a sort of uh well-defined caymanian identity that we see uh, the various ways in which, you know, culture is, is shaping and shifting. And so I do think that, um, yes, in terms of, you know, Cayman being a British overseas territory, but also um, thinking about the way in which our tourism industry, um, the majority of our tourists that, that come to the island are from the United States. And so how does that play into how we position ourselves as well too? Um, it's not necessarily European visitors that are coming to our shores. Um, and, and additionally, in terms of financial services, um, with, you know, decisions being made in the early stages of the industry um, of pegging our dollar to the U.S. dollar. So I do think that we see within various instances that there is an acknowledgement um, just due to us, you know, being in the, the Western Hemisphere and being so close to Florida and the U.S. Um, I do think that there are also is a special relationship uh, within Cayman and migration and migratory patterns that we have, you know, Caymanian um, enclaves in, in Texas, uh, in, you know, Tampa, Florida, um, within the Gulf Coast in Alabama um, as well too. So I do think that um, we do have a familiarity within the US. Um, I, my research hasn't necessarily um, developed that quite so fully, um, but I do think that there is space for us to acknowledge um, the type of, you know, media consumption as well too, uh, the way in which many Caymanian students are attending school in the U.S. So I do think that um, there definitely is more uh, research that could be fleshed out in terms of our connection to the U.S., you know, um, many Caymanians go on vacation to Florida. Many, um, you know, students attend university there and, and bring back, um, you know, these sort of life experiences that they've had. So I definitely think that there is um, more ways in which we can interrogate uh, the sort of relationship and, and I guess positionality that Caymanians have to the US as well. Um, so definitely thank you for your question and for your musings. Um, and, and I'll definitely, you know, reach out um, to you as as well because I'm definitely excited for the work that you're doing. Thanks Michaela, thanks Ms. O'Neill. Although I must say that how we view ourselves is not limited to culture, it's also embracing somebody's economy as well. So um, I'm not sure I'm there with him with the triple consciousness. Uh, the other issue um, that um, was coming, hold on, uh, just uh, reading a note here. Um, Dr. Liv, I was just following up on one of your notes. Um, right, sincere apologies. I was just uh, reading a note from Dr. Liv. Um, if there are no other questions, and if the, if you'd like to kind of like round off this conversation that we've been having, mix if, you know, that, and in fact, talk about how, you know, this is something that we can catapult into a broader arena to discuss, you know, and, perhaps when we are gonna do something like that in the future, if we could have a round, round in conversation with that and have Dr. Liv just provide some concluding 
remarks for us because people are sending me notes that um, time is ticking. Yes, definitely. Well, I want to thank everyone who is still, you know, hanging on <laughs> um, uh, to, to the presentation. I, I really appreciate it. And I think that, you know, it really speaks to um, the support that, that Ms. Teresa was talking about, but also the, the inquiry, you know, the curiosity that, that Keymanians have um, for, for this work and for this research as well, too. Um, and so, you know, uh, Dr. Smith, I'd love uh, to hear from you if you have any concluding thoughts. Um, but really just want to thank everyone um, and everyone who contributed uh, by, you know, uh, completing the survey, um, you know, answering my call <laughs> or, you know, WhatsApp message when I asked about interviews. Um, I, I really sincerely appreciate it. And I appreciate the trust um, that community had in me to, to have and to hold these discussions as well. Uh, Doctor, there's, there's, one one final, there's one final question. What steps do you think can be taken to create confidence in the concept of Caymanian experts throughout various fields. Yes, uh, thank, yeah. you, thank you so much for, for that question. I mean, I think that a lot of times Caymanians are perhaps operating in silos. Um, and I think that because we don't necessarily um, share the sort of expertise, but also uh, in terms of our understanding of the long sort of, you know, Caymanian political cultural legacy, you know, the long history um, of the expertise that Caymanian, you know, seamen and, and other um, avenues um, that, that persons from Cayman had. So I really think that um, capturing the sort of historical record um, would, would go a long way in, in terms of really um, uh, utilizing that to, to really build, you know, self-efficacy um, amongst Caymanians. Uh, and uh, someone also noted that the National Trust has a lot of literature as well. So yeah, maybe that is another avenue to explore. And Dr. Liv, I'll just pass it over to you now, pass the ball over to you, the mic, and let you provide thank us with some concluding thank thoughts. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Theresa. Dr. McKenna, again, we just want to thank you for this inspired uh, presentation and the insights you have brought to us. And um, you must know, of course, that you're an inspiration um, to the islands. and. Um, I would not close without making a plug for UCCI, all right? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, UCCI has produced uh, many, many excellent scholars. And um, uh, just uh, to say that uh, at university, these are the things that we try, we want to really um, emphasize. Um, before we leave, just to again emphasize that we have the book still for, uh, we still have copies of this book. And please don't leave without giving us your information so we can be in touch with you. Uh, we're going to be announcing very shortly the title of our next symposium and the, and the, so the call for papers will come very soon. I really want to excite all of us to be a part of the conversation, um, to do a paper, um, you know, interrogate the area, do the research, do the analysis, you know, and, and get published. So we can we can bring the critical levels of um, inquiry that we are trying to encourage uh, with the CPRCS. So again, everybody, thanks for coming, and um, all the best to you, uh, Dr. Mikado. We continue to follow your progress and and your and your publication that will come from what you've done. And uh, again, thank you, and all the best, everybody, as we end on this note. All the very best. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Pleasant evening, to everyone. The recording has stopped.